Hello, everyone. Hello, everybody. Hi, Marta. How are you? I'm doing good. How about you, George? Great. I'm looking forward to this uh, chat today. Another webinar. Yeah. Wow, your your background looks amazing. I just got to say. Thank you. I've up my uh, camera equipment just for this webinar today. Oh. So uh, well, I hope we get to hear about it. Yeah. Well, thanks to this nice camera, I get this nice blurry background image, which does look great. I agree. Yeah. Um, so, I see lots of people tuning in already. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello from Malta. Hello from Croatia, Indonesia, Portugal. Oh my God. Slovakia, Italy, Illinois. Shout out. <laughs> you're, you're Illinois. That's right. Hometown. I'm a little bit Illinois. I'm just <clears throat> you're part Illinois. Yeah. Buffalo Grove High School. Oh, go Bison. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining. We're just going to wait a few more minutes for everyone to join. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people commenting. Thank you. We, we love engagement during these webinars. Uh, we're just going to say right off the bat that we have a few polls ready for you. And they're down in the poll section below the video. And there's also a questions section, if you notice. So if you have a question at any point during the webinar, you can always go in there and ask your question and we'll try to address it at the end. Yeah, and we're gonna be running over all the parts of a studio. And the reason we like to talk about this, frankly, is because we've done it a number of times. We've been building studios for years now to either uh, do marketing like we're doing today or and also to learn about all the equipment that we talk about so that we have a better chance to understand what our customers are going through. So hopefully you have questions today and you can ask them and we can answer them. Uh, we're going to crank through a lot of content off the top, and then we have a lot of time for questions at the end. So uh, stick around if you want to chat with us. Exactly. Uh, and we have the, full, the first poll going up, and we're going to be asking you which industry you represent. Uh, it's always, or which, which, yeah, which industry is your business in. Uh, we always like to know these things because it helps us, as George said, to better connect with our customers. And it's just, we're just curious. It's interesting. So please uh, participate in those polls. That's so right. I'm, so how many people have we got here? We've got, a, have we know, got numbers on that, Marta? I can't see. I'm, I'm looking at you guys on my iPad here. And usually I can see the numbers, but not here. Uh, there's 730 people signed up, uh, but that's what I can see. But I'm not sure how many people are actually attending. Um, so let's hope we've got the bulk of everybody who's going to join us today and we can jump into the content. How does that sound, Marta? That sounds great. And our producer is telling us that there's 115 people in. That's awesome. That's very, very good. Um, yeah, it's, let's see, it's, it's 11.04 here on my clock. So I guess we can, we can get started. So sure. what are we, so, what are we talking about again, George, for everyone? Well, uh, we have a, a, an agenda here. So we're going to talk first about the equipment involved in setting up a studio, everything from lighting to cameras, to audio, to the encoding, uh, the networking side, all of that. We're going to try and give you a checklist of everything you need to, you need, uh, if you're going to, if you're planning to build a studio, uh, then Marta will be talking, of course, about the space itself, how to pick out a, a room that makes sense for a studio. Uh, we've made some good choices on that in the past and we've made some poor choices. So we can tell you some of those stories. Uh, we'll talk about some of the workflows that we've put in place to make things run smoothly uh, and make sure that everybody's on time and prepared. And then questions. Lots of time for questions at the end. Yeah, but feel free to ask your questions all throughout the webinar. If it's particularly relevant, we'll try to address it right away, but there will definitely be time for questions at the end. So mm -hmm. George, why, why would you want to build an on-premise video studio in the first place? That's a great question. And hopefully we find that out from uh, the polls and the chat and the uh, Crowdcast page. Uh, so let us know what, what kind of studio you want to build today. And we'll try to talk around that. We've traditionally been talking to people about uh, in a corporate space, people trying to do training studios to do tra uh, or educational content or they want to do executive messaging or panel discussions, but basically it's anyone looking to connect with their uh, external audience uh, for marketing purposes, that kind of thing, or for an internal audience for town hall meetings. Um, and that's, I'm, I'm talking specifically about the corporate sector, but you know, when it comes to education markets or people doing their own marketing content because they want to set up something for a YouTube channel, uh, we see those as well. So we'll mm -hmm. try to cover a, a spectrum here that fits for everybody. I'm actually looking at the polls right now. So um, 
we actually have a really wide range of, of different industries here. Uh, so we have about 20 people from technology, 20 from 22 from service, 22 from arts and edu arts and entertainment, and then 20% from education. So as, as we can see, lots of different people are interested in building an on-premise video studio. So that's great. We're going to tell you how to do that today. Yeah. So let's kick it off, Marta. Why don't we show a couple of pictures of some of the studios we've made in the past couple of years. Um, this yes, first picture let's... we're going to look at is one that you know uh, near and dear. What, tell us what we're looking at here. So we're actually looking at our, uh, as an Epifan Palo Alto office that we converted into a video studio. Um, this is kind of version, you know, not even one, version 0. 0.5 <laughs> beta. So here um, we, tried it, we tried to emulate kind of a live, live show um, situation where we have two hosts and then all the equipment around. And we can see the lights in the back. We've mounted some lights on the ceiling on those light rails. We have yep. those scissor lifts for the lights. We're going to go over all of this in great deal, great detail. I'm just trying to give a, a, a really brief overview. And then we have cameras pointed at the hosts. We can't see them, obviously. But this was this was our, our playground. This was uh, this is where we made all the mistakes to figure out how to do this right. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an example of a stock photo of a studio. So your studio will not look like this because uh, this has been achieve. all been staged kind of perfectly and you're going to have a lot more equipment in it and wires and things, but we'll try to make you get set up so that you can have a fairly tidy studio. Uh, this is a picture of our studio in Ottawa. Uh, in fact, this studio is being used right now. Uh, kind of, it's kind of a ghost studio, right? Where we, yeah. no we one a, is actually a, there. There it is. Cameron's showing us, is, our yeah. producer <laughs> showing us uh, the actual live feed from that room right now. Yeah. No hosts. So we're, we're feeding our, 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 Marta and I, our video feed is going into this studio and we're using the equipment in that room and it's being operated remotely. So it's a bit of an inception style studio, uh, which we won't get into today, but it does give you a glance at, at what a studio can look like. Um, exactly. This gives you an idea of, of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. So let's jump right into that. Uh, the checklist. So okay. all the things you're going to need to get running with your studio. Right. So you're definitely going to need some lighting. Uh, counting just on natural light from your windows might not be ideal. We're going to cover cameras and lenses, audio equipment, uh, and then switching and recording and producing your video. And we're also going to talk about the production side, like the production computer, monitors, and other things you might need to get your production going. That's right. So let's kick it off with lighting. We'll, we'll move through this pretty quickly because uh, we know a lot of you will probably understand fairly well how to light your room, or you might know about cameras. So we won't dwell too long on any of these. Um, and we'll respond based on your feedback in the chat and in the questions on what you want us to dive into a little bit more deeper. So Marta will kick us off with a quick lighting primer. Uh, what do I need to get uh, a basic lighting setup in my studio, Marta? So generally, we talk about a three-point lighting uh, system, which we're going to get into a bit later. But again, um, there, there are various setups that you can do. Natural light is great. So uh, I think George and I are both using natural light right now to light ourselves. However, in a studio situation, uh, it might be a bit more difficult because you're at mercy of, of the weather for that day. So you're going to need some stands and some lights. Lights that we like personally are these Falcon falconized because they're LED panels. They don't heat up. They're really nice to use. Um, and we have this kind of um, maybe an, a bit uh, older model. I think it's also an LED. Yes, it is. Uh, the Cowboy Studio flat panel lights. The nice thing about the Falcon eyes is that you can change the temperature on them, right? Which means you can change the color of that light. Yeah, and, um, and that's true with a lot of the LED lights as well, that if you pay a little bit more, you get full color control over your lights, which means uh, you can correct for... Uh, Poor lighting, poor other camera. If you don't like the way your camera image is, you can kind of warm it up a little bit that way. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to the have the white that. balance. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, and then with with the lights that don't have uh, those dimmable or um, color changing lights, you can use something called color gels, right? So you just insert it uh, right over the light, and you get the color uh, that you want. We have a nice light for that. 
Um, so depending on how you want to correct your color, if the light just seems way too cold, you can warm it up with a, with a more yellow gel. And if it's just way too, way too yellow, like from incandescent lighting, you can make it a little bit cooler using bluer lights. This is also mm -hmm. nice for accent lights if you want to create a nice background like we do in our studio sometimes. Yeah, I can't get enough of these filters, to be honest with you. I we, we use them in our studio all the time because it's so nice if your background light is a bit different temperature than your foreground light. So it's often you'll want your subjects to be nice and warm and look full of life. But to set that off nicely, if you add purple light or blue light to your background, uh, they'll just pop off the screen. And Marta and I are both in a natural light setting, so we can't really illustrate that for you today. But if you look at the videos on our YouTube channel, you'll see quite a lot of that kind of uh, mm -hmm. look. <clears throat> So how many lights can we get away with? So the kind of the classic setup is involves three lights. Uh, the first one is called the key light, which is the main light. It gives you uh, the maximum amount of light out of the three. Uh, so let's say you light one, of, one side um, of your talent. Then you're using something called a fill light from the other side, kind of at a 45 degree angle from the other side. It's not gonna be as intense as the key light, but since you're creating a lot of shadow on the talent's face from the first light, from the key light, you're going to have to balance it out using the fill light from the other side. So once you have those two lights, that's, that's already a pretty good setup. But then to kind of separate your subject from the background, use something called a backlight or a rim light. Now, this backlight is also going to be a lot softer than the key light and the fill light. Um, you can place it behind the subject and pointed at the subject, it's going to give the talent this kind of nice rim of light. Or you can also shoot it at the background if you have a solid background. And that's just wow. going to give you that extra separation. It's going wow. to look much nicer. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we had a question, somebody asking to see the, the filters here again um, in the chat. Mm -hmm. And filters, it filters is one way to adjust your light. But Marty, you mentioned you might want to soften your light as well. So there's a lot of tricks that you can do there. You can use a Basically, it's like a big, imagine shining a light through a big bed sheet if, and how it would soften the light. There's lots of little uh, things on the market that we showed in this other slide, like this, like a reflector. That's basically a big panel you can put up in front of a harsher light and it'll soften it for you. So controlling the, the texture of your light, uh, there's an art to that. You can use these softeners to make it uh, soft, but you might want a hard light too. So often that backlight that's coming over the rim light, you actually kind of want that harsh. It gives a nice sort of edge to it. So playing with right. the texture of the light right. is something else uh, people can get it. So you can use something something like a soft box, uh, George, if you could go back to, to the previous slide. Uh, um, this one here, Marta? No. Just the one that you had on right now? Yeah, that one. Um, okay. Yeah, the the a light with like this, this fixture over it that diffuses the light is called a soft box which can provide a much, much softer light without those harsh shadows, which is something that uh, you're probably sometimes looking for. So that's right. And, and they're dirt cheap too. You can get these on, uh, you know, Amazon. Mm -hmm. I hate to buzz market Amazon, not that they need, <laughs> they need any more publicity, but you can get them there for like 20 bucks. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. the things to keep in mind is that you probably want to pick dimmable lights to be able to control the intensity of the light. You want lights that can change colors or uh, change the temperature, or you can use gels for that. Uh, and also think about diffusing and and softening your light. The different the different ways to do that. Um, so, Marta, you've had first hand in mounting your lights. Um, oh, that's right. Yes. Uh, we have another image here showing the image on the left is your Palo Alto studio. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to see because the image is quite small, but I can see this giant scissor shaped thing. What is that that we're looking yeah. at here where those red arrows are pointing to? That was a very, very convenient thing, the scissor, the scissor lift. Um, so if you don't want your lights to be on the ground, they are kind of bulky. Those C stands do take up a lot of space. So if you don't want that, uh, what you can do is you can mount your lights to the ceiling. Now for that, you can use various systems. Um, in our Palo Alto office, the picture on the left, uh, we used a light rail system that we mounted to the ceiling. And th so those rails, they kind of move independently. So you can get your light exactly where you want it. Um, yeah, the scissor lift is just really nice for adjusting the level. Really easy. That's and great, then yeah. This picture on the, on the right that we see, this has 
a more kind of industrial system, I guess, uh, these aluminum trusses that are also mounted to the ceiling. And this is great for larger spaces, people, um, uh, spaces with more, with more people, basically, when you're trying to shoot more people. Uh, they're going to give you, basically, you don't have to, see, we, we see about six lights there, and you don't have to have six stands standing on the floor taking up space. You can just have them up on the ceiling. Yeah. And I think for most people, that's going to be a budget decision if they can afford to install these big uh, trusses. You know, this is a $10,000 and up kind of investment. So mm -hmm. not for the uh, people just starting out probably, but uh, certainly long-term, I think it's a great investment to keep everything up off the floor and you can actually keep your studio clean. Right. It's very hard to do when you have uh, cables and stands everywhere. Exactly. And I'm just getting a, a note here that these scissor lifts that we're calling them, we always call them that, they're actually called uh, pantograph flight mounts. Pantographs. Uh, that's, a, yes. that's a good name. Okay. If you want to look that up. So uh, I guess now we should jump into cameras. That's and, right. Uh, we were talking a little bit off the, the top about how I have a much better camera image today because we've been doing a lot of these webinars and I wasn't very happy with my webcam image. So I upgraded to a mirrorless camera to give me this nice soft background. But we'll cover the whole gamut of cameras that you may want to choose for your studio, depending what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, do so you want me to we... run through this, Marta, or? So I'm just wondering, how do you approach choosing a, a camera for your studio, George? I think a lot of it depends on your comfort level with cameras. Uh, for a lot of people, they don't really know how to manually adjust cameras. So that's going to eliminate, you know, 75% of the cameras on the market because there's a lot of cameras that are really powerful and give you extraordinary images. But if you don't know how to operate them or if you don't have the time to invest in understanding them, you'll find it completely frustrating. So for those people, let's start with those people. If you're someone who just needs a camera to work and you don't consider yourself a camera person, something like a PTZ camera. Uh, on this image here, it's this little white camera. Um, those are wonderful cameras because uh, they, they work right out of the box, just like a point and shoot camera. And you, they, the PTZ means uh, point, uh, pan, tilt, and zoom, sorry. And it comes with a remote control. So you can be sitting in one place in your room and just directly point your camera to where you want it to, to go. So they're designed for people who don't want to fuss around too much with cameras and they have typically have great zoom capabilities on them as well. So very versatile. Um, and built for professionals typically. And you can control them through an interface on your computer or, or elsewhere with a remote? That's right, yes. Yeah. So you, you can get a little remote control uh, sort of keyboard thing and actually control it with a joystick as well. Nice. Um, so great control, especially in a, in a situation where maybe you, your camera is located in a weird place in your room and you don't actually, you're not actually able to get, get to the camera. Or if you're on camera and you want to control your image as well, you can use it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are ones that our customers tend to use a lot of. Um, we have a lot of customers who use camcorders as well. Um, so in fact, I have some cameras here. I'll just, I'll pull up a little variety. Oh, show and tell. Let's do it. Sure. Yeah. So um, with these camcorders, Cameron, maybe you can pull up the full image and I can show what these are. So this is a Canon, what is it? A Vixia HF. This is a G50 from Canon. Um, and the beautiful thing about a camcorder is, again, it's just going to work like right out of the box. You're not going to have to do very much in, you're not going to have to worry about controlling the image. You can do all of that stuff, but um, it's going to be the easiest thing to operate. And they're, because they're video cameras, they're designed to just run constantly. Um, mm -hmm. So again, we're big fans of these cameras as well, but they're not going to give you this beautiful soft image like you're seeing here. You can't get this kind of image with a camcorder because the, the lens, the chip in them is just not built for that. Mm -hmm. So, and they come in very small sizes too. So this is a Canon Vixia R80. So it's a tiny little camera, but it'll be great for live streaming if you're just getting started. That's exactly what I'm using right now, just uh, oh, as, a, as an example. Yes. Yeah, it's tiny, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really small. And yeah. then it has the nice little flip out screen. So I'm able to see myself um, for confidence monitoring. There we go. Yeah. And you can yeah. flip it the other way, which is, which is really neat. Yes, that's a nice feature for all there these cameras so that you can actually see yourself in the, ima in the image. Mm -hmm. um, so then beyond that, we move up to the small uh, mirrorless cameras. 
So this is a Canon EOS M, I believe. The M200, this is an M200. So it's their kind of entry-level mirrorless camera and it comes with interchangeable lenses. And that basically means you can put on lenses to get different kinds of effects, not just uh, zoom capabilities, but if you wanna have what we call this bokeh or blurry background effect, you need a camera that has a interchangeable lens system like this. Mm -hmm. So in order to get um, the effect that you have right now, George, you might use something like this. Correct, yeah. You need a camera that can put on a lens with a very wide aperture. So an aperture, I mean, we could go down this rabbit hole quite a ways. We won't go too deep on it, but um, it would allow you to get this kind of image. Mm -hmm. This is still gonna cost you, I don't know, a thousand dollars or something like that, plus lenses. So your investment level goes up considerably as soon as you get into these cameras that have interchangeable lenses, uh, as well as the experience needed to operate them because they're not as automated as camcorders and such. Mm -hmm. um, but we're big fans of them here as well because they give great images. Right. So, so then the what camera is that the... I'm using yeah. today, okay. um, I have two more cameras to show. This is the camera, well, this is almost the camera that I'm using today. This is the EOS R. So it Canon's, it's Canon's mirrorless series and it's got a big honking lens on it. Uh, but of course it gives these beautiful images, right? So mm -hmm. if you're a camera buff, you might enjoy a camera like this. But again, it's not the most practical thing for everybody to get started with. And Marty, you always talk about these cameras. You must have a clean HDMI signal coming out of them. Exactly. This is if we're talking about streaming. For recording, it, there's, there's more leeway. But if you want to do live streaming with your camera, you have to keep in mind three things. First one, uh, it has to have a clean HDMI out, which means um, as you're streaming, we're not going to be able to see all those UI elements uh, over the video, right? Mm -hmm. uh, second one is the camera shouldn't shut off after a little bit. For example, I have this, I have this lovely 7D, but great camera for pictures, terrible camera for live streaming because it shuts off automatically. It just flips up the mirror after about uh, five to 10 minutes of being idle. And uh, the third thing is it has to have external power because if you're gonna be streaming for, for an hour, the battery is not gonna be able to last that long and you want that power source to be available to you. So um, out of the cameras that you mentioned, George, would you say that all of these um, um, follow these rules? Yeah, well, every, the advantage here, I'm dealing with all brand new cameras. And so the newer cameras tend to be more suited towards video applications. And so uh, I don't know of any of these cameras that I've talked about today that wouldn't be suitable for live streaming. So it, with, when any of these form factors, you can get a camera that's gonna work for you. So it's really about preference. Mm -hmm. Now, there is one more style, which is the cinema camera. So Ooh. this is your uh, big brother to, or big sister to the uh, SLR style cameras or mirrorless cameras. And it's basically built for doing video. So it has a lot of video related functions. It can re record at really, really high bit rates. And your film people in your business or your company are going to love these cameras because they're incredibly powerful. They also cost exponentially more. This is a um, C200. And honestly, it's, I don't remember the retail. It's $5,000 or $8,000. And then well, you have to kit it out as well with you know uh, accessories and lenses as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not a modest investment. But so it'll last you a really, long time. Yeah. Do you really need something like that if you're if you're just starting out with your studio? Starting out, it depends on the on the like, um, depends on who your audience is. If you want to build something that's really professional, so that you can have cinematographers come in and actually work in your studio, they may be more familiar with this kind of equipment, where they know it's going to work and it's not going to have any any hiccups. So. Um, there are people who are going to build a studio for the first time and they're going to use cameras like this because they're mm -hmm. built for broadcast or that kind of thing. So, right. So uh, we actually don't need it though. We actually have a question um, about that. We have, which is, uh, which is the best camera for a low budget? And I see, I see that someone already, um, one of our moderators has commented that we have a great article on that uh, 19 best cameras for live streaming for any budget. So be sure to mm -hmm. check that out. 
But uh, uh, George, what what would you what would you say to that? What would be well, your recommendation? We've been talking about this a lot lately because a lot of our people are like me, working from home and trying to make video content. And so we talk a lot about the Sony A series. So that's the Sony A sixty three hundred or sixty five hundred or five thousand. I, I don't know how to describe it, but they start with A and they have four digits after it. Mm -hmm. And they all take interchangeable lenses and they start around five hundred dollars. You can get a little kit lens and a and a camera, and it's going to be great for live streaming so those are uh definitely ones that we we advocate for as well as the camcorders as well the entry level mm -hmm. camcorders are usually pretty adequate as well yeah they're um, really easy to use uh they usually have a clean hdmi out if you're doing streaming and they're just ready to go straight out of the box you yeah put the them on audio a tripod. go ahead sorry i was gonna say the audio consideration for your camera may be what dictates what camera you buy because if you want to be able to get audio into that camera and then bring the camera and audio in together, you better make sure that your camera is capable of uh, accepting some kind of audio input device. Some oh, cameras yeah, do that well. A lot of them don't. So That's another good point. So, yeah. so we've talked about cameras. Uh, we've talked about lenses a little bit. Maybe we can actually um, go back for just a second. Um, sure. we, we briefly mentioned that you, know, you need a tripod. For your camera that's it's very convenient stable shot uh kind of you know that makes makes perfect sense um that's just something to keep in mind i just wanted to to mention that for sure yeah okay. um so should we jump into audio marta sure i think there was another question that i saw that related to cameras so if you use a 35 millimeter as your camera can you not adjust the white balance? You uh, certainly can. You can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in do you uh, mean like in the settings or using outside lights? Um, I'm not sure what your question is, Marvin. Hold on. Did you say okay? If you use a 35 millimeter camera, you can or you can't adjust the white balance. You can adjust the white balance on any camera. So I think maybe they're talking about. I was making a comment. Um, you can sort of overcome uh, poor image quality that you don't love in your camera. Maybe not overcome. Sometimes, sometimes having colored lights allows you to influence the image that you're getting out of your camera. Because some cameras are really flat looking, and, or, like where everything is just a bit, a bit bland and they don't have great color profiles. So sometimes adding a bit of a color boost to your actual lights uh, can help that. Okay. Yeah. But okay. So you can adjust the, the white balance. Look in your settings or use different lights to control that temperature. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, okay, so moving right along into audio equipment. So what should, what's, what should we talk about here, Marta? All right, so audio equipment, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, we're gonna talk about microphones. Uh, people always ask which is the best microphone to use. Uh, we're also gonna talk about something that you touched on, George, embedded HDMI versus external audio. So how do you bring in the audio into, mm -hmm. into your video? Uh, audio interfaces and mixers, how do you bring an analog signal into your computer? And we're gonna talk about audio monitoring as well. So let's start with microphones. George, can you, can you walk us through the various types of microphones? Sure, I mean, yeah, we use all of these mics all the time. So in our studio environment, uh, our go-to mic uh, would be the lavalier mics. These are the little clip-on microphones that you can put on your shirt. And there's two reasons why I think they're a great choice. Uh, they're discreet, so you don't see them. And your host has mobility. So your host can get up and walk around the room if they need to and show stuff around and, and turn to the people beside them and speak. And it, unlike a mic that's pointed right at their mouth, uh, it gives them that mobility. So I really like the lavaliers. They do cost a lot. Um, I've not experimented with the low cost ones very much. Um, so the ones we use generally are in the 500 to $1,000 range for mm -hmm. a little lavalier uh, pack. Well, you get a body we, pack. we have experimented with the low quality ones, with the low cost <laughs> ones, George, and I would not recommend it. I yeah, would yeah. recommend spending the 500 on a Sennheiser because those, those work well. There's no noise. There's no like weirdness. They're really easy to uh, configure. So I would, I would 
consider spending the 500 on those? I think so. I've never seen a solution I liked that didn't actually cost about $500. And it's too bad because I know a lot of people want to get started with some kind of mic system, but uh, it's going to be hard for them to get great audio without lavalier mics because it's kind of the same with the shotgun mics as well. So if you're not using a lavalier mic and you want to use uh, either a, a mic like I'm using here mounted in front of me, uh, or a shotgun mic. Uh, again, they, they can get quite pricey as well. And as the, the the price really comes if you want to have that mic not right up in the person's mouth. So this mic here that I have in front of my mouth, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money because it's really close to me. And it, I think this is a hundred dollar microphone. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also want, good. Sorry. In a studio I... in a studio environment, you're going to want to mount it up high. Sorry, Marta, I didn't mean to cut you off. In which case, you're going to need some kind of a shotgun mic that can really go for long distances the, the the polar pattern is going to work well for that mm -hmm. yeah i was just going to say if you have the microphone just as a general rule of thumb if you have the microphone close close to the talent's mouth then that also helps eliminate other noise in the room so having that microphone as close as you can to the person's mouth is really beneficial for sure and yeah getting rid of that there's always going to be some noise in the room it's amazing what you hear when you plug in a microphone and just stick it in an empty room how much noise there is yeah um, we we struggled with it mightily in all of our studios and the only solution you're right is getting it close to close to your talent as possible mm -hmm. we do we we also in that studio that you saw the palo alto studio with the green background we tried all kinds of different variations we had a microphone hanging from the ceiling uh and it picked up all kinds of noise <laughs> except what we wanted it to pick up so <laughs> we had to go with the wireless lavaliers in the end we found that that is the best solution yeah, and they do cut out a lot of the background noise too. So they do. they're really they do. good at killing that noise out. Mm -hmm. um, you can get on camera mounted microphones as well and put them right on top of your camera. But in most cases, your camera tends to be a little bit too far away from your talent for that to work, unless it's kind of a, a vlogger style video or something really intimate where they, you're right up in the grill at your, your subjects. But if we're talking about a studio environment, that's generally not going to fly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So someone's um, asking actually what you would recommend for a podcast, which, which microphone would recommend for podcast, podcast? Is, is a delight because you actually don't need a, to invest a ton of money in it. I know people do. I, well, the podcasts I listen to, they're always talking about Neumann mics and all these crazy high end microphones that they want really rich sounds from. But anecdotally, this is a hundred dollar mic and I think it sounds pretty good as long as I'm like nice and close to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's it. I'm not a podcaster, so I don't feel comfortable making a, a great recommendation there. I don't know about you, Marta. Do you so do any podcasting? I, I know not at all. I listen to podcasts. I've got fans. <laughs> <I'm> a, <laughs> I have heard really good things about the Blue Yeti, and I know we talk about that a lot on this on this show on on these webinars. Uh, the Blue Yeti is really easy because uh, it's a USB microphone, goes right on your desktop, and you can you can connect it very easily to your computer, and it get, has pretty good sound as well. Not yeah, I'm a huge fan as well, and it doesn't actually need to be that close to your mouth, so. It can be off camera as well if it's a video production you're doing and it'll still pick up uh, your audio pretty well. Mm -hmm. So what about patterns? Do, do you, why should we care about microphone patterns, George? Well, uh, every microphone has a certain polar pattern that it can pick up and some of them can pick up multiple patterns. And you can see this little diagram on screen here. We have this blue halos around the different patterns. So it's basically showing like where, do, where in the room does that microphone pick up sound? Um, and sometimes you want a really broad microphone to capture sound from all different parts of a room. So I get why you might want an omnidirectional microphone, but in most cases, especially in a studio environment, you're going to want a shotgun microphone, which is more pinpointed, very narrowly focused towards the camera. So that, sorry, towards your talent so that you'll pick up their voice and not all the noises around them. So, mm -hmm. uh, something to consider, but, uh, we could go once again, pretty deep on microphone polar patterns as well. So maybe we should move on and talk about how to bring those uh, microphones into your broadcast. For sure. For sure. Let's do that. So um, once again, we mentioned that some, some microphones have XLR outputs, right? And you can't connect an XLR output directly to your computer. Uh, so we're going to talk about how to do that, how to bring that sound in, um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about mixers and uh, how to get that sound exactly the way you want to. Mm -hmm. 
again, this is another thing we're all struggling with. I shouldn't say struggling with. We're dealing with this right now as we try and outfit our homes to be studios. And in a lot of cases, we end up using some kind of audio interface. So you might call this a preamp. It might be a mixer, but it's some way to convert the audio signals that you're getting from your microphones and to be able to ultimately get them onto your, your production system, which could be a computer. Like today, Marta and I, you and I are using computers to stream this to a Pearl. Anyway, it's kind of complicated. Or you want to get it. Um, however, you're going to be encoding that video. You need to get the audio onto that. Mm -hmm. And so using, using a little audio interface that can convert it to USB, like this focus, right? This little red thing that we're highlighting here. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very easy to use solution to get some kind of a XLR mic uh, into your computer, or you may have a, in a studio environment, it's likely you have multiple audio sources, in which case you'll need a mixer mm -hmm. and you'll want a mixer because you'll get to do all kinds of cool stuff to your audio and make it sound great. You might want to bring in music sources from a computer and bring those into your mixer. Um, so ultimately you'll end up with some kind of mixer in your studio and it could be a completely huge, massive, complicated mixer. If your person leading your studio is a former audio person, or it can be just a very basic thing like this, like these focus, right? Preamps. Yeah. It just gives you a lot more control over, over the sound because sometimes if you have two guests, um, uh, one audio might be a little bit louder, the other one a bit softer. And if you want to equalize all of that, make sure that it sounds great. You're going to need a mixer. Mm-hmm. Um, and that leads us to being able to monitor that audio. So you need to, of course, be able to deal with the signals of the mics from your talent, but then you need to be able to hear them and isolate them uh, in your headphones. Uh, and to do that well, you probably want to be monitoring them from another room, uh, not the same room, because it's, it's hard to be in the same room with someone and evaluate their audio that you're hearing through the air as well as through a pair of headphones. So having some isolation uh, between you and the studio is going to help your uh, controller. That's right. Do we have an image for that or is that coming up later? Uh, we do have an image. Let's see if I can just jump there now. Ba -ba -ba, our studio, where is that? So we're actually, we're going to show you an image of a control room that we have, which is separated from the main studio, making it much easier to control the sounds. So you're not in the room. You're not actually, you're not hearing the talent. You're just hearing the output. That's right. So this is our little glass windowed room, you know, the old, like a music studio where you have the people outside of the room. So it's nice because we can actually talk in here and make noise and, and heckle yeah. the talent and they can't hear us. It's lovely. <laughs> you have a door, you can close it, you can lock them in there and just go about your day. That's right. So um, one other little detail we need to talk about is the mix minus. So if your studio is set up where you have an audio feedback into the ear of your talent, so think of your you know, broadcast media where they, they're getting notes from the producer, you need to be able to customize what kind of audio signal is going back into the ear of your talent. Mm -hmm. And likely, uh, they call it mix minus because you don't want to be sending their own voice back into their own ear. So if I'm speaking into this microphone and you're, I don't want to hear it in my ear. So that's what's called a mix minus. Um, but I might want a producer to be telling me, hey, you know, fix your hair. I don't get that comment, but uh, there's other things they might want me to fix a lot. So, so these are the kinds of considerations you need to do when you're figuring out how to route your audio in your studio. Right. Okay, so why don't we jump into switching recording and encoding gear? So sure. So after you have your camera and when you have your sound, you need to a you need a way to capture all that. If you have multiple sources, you need a way to mix them and uh, switch between them. And there there are various solutions for that. Uh, you can use software to do that, or uh, you can use hardware. But you you have to have some kind of way to bring all of those sources in and mix, mix them. Yeah, and this is really our wheelhouse because we make uh, video encoders that do switching, streaming, and recording. And so we like to look around the entire industry and see how people are doing it. And our solution, uh, we focus on an all-in-one solution where you bring in all your audio signals and all your video signals into one piece of hardware, which in our case is a Pearl 2. Um, because we find it's a, it's a pretty elegant way to do it and it leaves a little less room for things to go wrong when it's in a dedicated appliance like Pearl 2 or Pearl Mini. 
Um, but a lot of people like to do this as well over software. So they have a really powerful computer and some capture cards and they'll bring in their audio and video signals that way and use a software program like vMix to do their streaming. Um, they're both completely viable ways and it kind of depends on your personality, which way you want to go on this and how much complexity uh, you're willing to deal with. Um, the people who buy our Pearl equipment tend to want something where they just know it's going to work and they don't have to fuss around with it too much. So uh, that's right. I think that's, that's a real advantage of this kind of all in one solution. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, actually, like you said, Marta, sorry. I was going to say there's an amazing set of features on uh, all in one hardware encoders because you can bring in your sources, you can mix them. We have a tool called Epifan Live, which is actually the live production mixer where you can switch between the various layouts. Uh, we have a feature um, automatic file uploads where you don't have to think about where your video goes after you're done it's just going to be exactly where you want it so there are all those features and you know it's going to work as you said george so it just gives you that peace of mind yeah and that's what we're using for today's broadcast so that's how these layouts are being built that you're seeing that's how these titles are coming on screen uh, all of this is being pushed into the pearl um, and being broadcast out to you so this is kind of an exhibit of what you may what's possible with a with a pearl encoder Mm -hmm. um, and it's also being to... used in all these studios that we showed those pictures of, like that studio within Crestron. They're using our Pearl for the same kind of thing. And so it's, it's pretty well known as a, as a good solution for a studio environment. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn more about these devices, we're going to throw a link uh, up into chat, or perhaps there's going to be a button below the video. So if you want to learn more about Pearl 2 and Pearl Mini, we're going to have a link available real soon. Yeah, and stick around after this broadcast today. We'll answer your questions if you want to talk a little bit more about how we're doing this broadcast today. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about hardware. We talked a little bit about software encoding. Let's hop straight to, to the production, production computer and monitors. There we go. Yeah. We showed you the slide earlier. So in order to, um, so you, you have all your video sources coming in, you have a way to capture that and switch between that. Uh, there's a few more pieces uh, of equipment that you're going to need. So a production computer, obviously, to control all that. Right now we have our producer um, switching between all of these layouts using a computer. We also have titling software. Maybe you've noticed our producers throwing up things like, you know, there's a new poll. Speaking of which, don't forget to participate in our <laughs> polls, please. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Um, uh, so yeah, if you have titling software, it's just another piece. It's kind of a, it's a more, I would say advanced option. Um, we just kind of like all those bells and whistles. Um, but then, but then also confidence monitoring, right? So your producer has to be able to see the final output. And it's also really good for the talent to see, uh, what, what they look like, uh, in the final video. Two-way communication or tally. So it's it's really nice that you know that you're on air, that red light goes on live. Really, really convenient. And um, two-way communication between the producer and the talent. For example, right now we're using Zoom as our back channel uh, communication channel. And if our producer has any notes or if any of the moderators have any notes, that's how they communicate that with us. We can also, I think during the live shows, we have a confidence monitor where the producer can communicate with you directly through that confidence monitor. Now, this, this feed isn't being fed out as the final product, only you can see that as the talent. So that's also, that's also really convenient because when you're live, you know, you, you might be forgetting things or there are always notes as you, as you George, as you mentioned earlier. Mm. Yeah, this is one of the trickier parts of setting up a production, I find, is having that back channel communication. Because if I'm trying to focus on this webinar like I am today, and I'm looking into the camera, and I'm trying to make sure I'm as clear as possible, the last thing I want to do is be able to hear or read notes from somebody else. So finding a way to do this without driving your on-air talent crazy uh, and doing it but you have to be persistent enough so they can get those messages when things start to go a little sideways on them. 
um, it's delicate and it's tricky and we use things, we use physical props. So I'll, I'll tape stickers on top of cameras and say, Hey, look up here because sometimes people forget okay. to look at the camera or we'll use whiteboards in the studio and communicate with them that way. Or we'll send them messages on their phone. Like I've had people text me during a broadcast and say, Hey, you know, your top button's undone and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. whatever you can do to communicate with your talent, figure it out. But it's, it, it is nuanced for sure. That's right. Some of the other tools. <laughs> there we go. George, <laughs> fix your hair. That's that's our producer um, popping up that message. Some of the other tools include teleprompter. Now, teleprompters are good for more for recording rather than streaming. For example, in our Palo Alto studio, we had a teleprompter. Um, the people who use that the most were, you know, CEOs who were recording a very short, concise message. And they wanted to get that, that, those words exactly right. So they had a teleprompter to help them out with that. I'm sure a teleprompter can be used live. Uh, it takes some practice. Newscasters do it all the time. That's also a tool that you should consider depending on whether you need it or not. Mm -hmm. You can also just use it to put notes up as well. It doesn't have to be just script based. Having, <laughs> if I could have my notes for this program right in front of the camera lens, uh, that would be delightful because then you'd never see my eyes look away. So mm -hmm. a pretty useful tool. Mm -hmm. And this last one is networking switches, something I wish I had right now. Uh, so networking switches basically let you uh, plug in your ethernet into a single box and then get many more cables out of that. So right now I only have, uh, because I'm in my house and I don't have a networking switch, I only have kind of one ethernet cable to deal with. Um, but networking networking boxes are really, really useful tools because there are more things that you think that work from Ethernet that are dependent on Ethernet. So, um, Marta, let's, let's see if we can pick this up a little bit. We're going to try and get through the rest of this content uh, here in about 15 minutes. And we're going to talk about how to build your studio space. And we're going to talk a little bit about workflows as well. So this is where we get into literally the nuts and bolts of, of this whole presentation. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the space, right? So uh, when you're choosing a location, you have to think about a few things. You have to think about acoustics. Uh, you have to think about the size of the room and uh, the light, right? So how much light you're getting. For example, this room is not, the, the room that you're seeing on your screen right now is not ideal for a, a video production studio because look at those gigantic oh, I'm sorry. windows. Yeah, this is a big challenge. If you're trying yes. to set up a studio in a room full of windows, it's also a busy street in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. So if you recall, the, remember the noise that would come into this space oh, yeah. as well? The sirens, yes, it's not This was boot camp, like how to build a studio in a difficult environment. That's what this project should have been called. Exactly. So ideally it should be a room without any windows or the windows should be taped somehow. Uh, like we or, do. or you or you decide you're always going to be filming at a certain time during a day, but never at <laughs> dusk and dawn. Exactly. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of sound, this, for example, this concrete floor isn't really helping. Having carpeting is much would be a much better option. Now you can't see it, but we actually have uh, acoustic panels taped to the walls, which dampens the sound because otherwise mm -hmm. there, there echoes galore in this in this space. You make a good point. It's it's almost like you should be choosing your room for your studio with your eyes closed because it's the audio part that is going to drive you nuts. Exactly. Uh, you can make any room look okay, either with a small green screen or even just a plain wall or a bit of colored lights or something like that behind you. That's pretty easy to fix. But trying to fix a room with bad audio is going to be, uh, you're going to look like me with no hair when you're done. <laughs> now, you also have to think about the size of your room, right? So we say that kind of the bare minimum is about 12 by 18 feet, right? Because you do need that separation between the talent and the camera, and then also the talent and the background, because you don't want to have the person sitting way too close to the wall that casts really harsh shadows. And that's a really hard environment to control. So also consider the, the size of your room. For sure, for sure. Okay, so this is a really, um, yeah, you had you had the other slide up, it's just a really good illustration. Oh, yeah, a really good illustration on kind of the basics that you should be thinking about, right? So acoustics, a really neat background without any distractions, kind of have a lot of things going on here. Um, so, and again, soft carpeting for uh, to absorb those those sound waves.
Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, acoustic treatment. So this is our studio, our oldest studio in our Ottawa offices. And what you'll notice is that those little gray boxes on the, on the side are, are actually, um, what are they called? Sound absorbing panels, sound panels. I'm not mm -hmm. sure what they're called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we mounted them all over that room and it, you could go in that room and clap your hands and it was dead silent. So it was beautiful. Uh, and that was thanks to Mathieu Renault, our colleague, who is our uh, audio, one of our audio whizzes, um, who could help us with that. So now we've gotten pretty familiar with just the idea of any kind of soft surfaces in your room is going to uh, negate most of the noise in there. Mm -hmm. And Mathieu was actually talking about the clap test, as you just said, George. So you walk into a room, clap your hands, and then you see uh, whether there's, a, there's echo. Yeah. Yeah, I could hear a little bit in your room and you could in mine as well because I'm in yes. a not well dampened room either. So mm -hmm. um, this is just a photograph of our our newer studio, uh, which is a little bit more contained and we you can't really tell, but we do have some pretty good sound dampening mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, we actually have more than than three lights. We're talking about the three point lighting setup in our studio. We use more like five lights for the for the various effects that we want to achieve and you don't have to have five lights but we just wanted to play around a little bit more with the atmosphere and just really fine-tuning uh, the look of our final shot yeah yeah you can never have too many lights that's kind of mm -hmm. the, what we've learned yeah now this um, is a really nice one this is kind of a higher more higher end studio isn't it george yeah they certainly had a big capital investment in this space just to get all the rigging in place and they built those walls in the background this is at Crestron's uh, headquarters in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, a little bit of budget uh, helps <laughs> is really the lesson here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really helps. Yeah. Um, get some and budget, then first step. First step, get money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Step number three, profit. profit. Uh, do we have a picture of our, is that the next one, the control room? that we have a next uh we already hit on that one actually uh, i just wanted to i just wanted to mention uh what we use this space for we use it for our live show and just a reminder we go live every thursday at 3 p.m eastern and uh if you guys want to join us for that uh please go on to our youtube channel on thursdays we talk about great stuff this week's episode is going to be about all about streaming and levels of redundancy uh, it talks about professional live streaming and how to make sure that your stream doesn't go down in mission critical situations. Yeah, that should be a good show. Mm -hmm. um, so again, a few other details when it comes to setting up a studio is your cabling management. This is the kind of nerdy stuff that all the other uh, studio engineers are probably just applauding right now with delight. Cable management. Uh, and yes. networking and security because you want your room to be safe for one thing. You want it to be easy to use and be able to find what you need quickly because you're, in our case, we're constantly kind of ripping it apart and rebuilding it for different configurations. So um, mm -hmm. keeping it well organized helps. Yeah. So things like, you know, things like gaffer tape go a long way. People are going to trip over cables no matter how many times you tell them, you know, be careful. So just taping things down, making sure everything neat. Is really important not just for aesthetics but also for safety mm -hmm. and we've kind of buried one of these categories we should be doing a whole slide about it says ethernet access here but we're, we're really talking about is like networking capabilities here you mm -hmm. need to make sure you have a very good network um, and in our case we talk about that for an hd stream meaning you know uh what eight thousand kilobits up so you have your upload speed and your download speed. So you have to make sure you have enough upload speed for all of the streams you want to do. And as Cameron was pointing out before the show, if you're doing streaming to Facebook and YouTube at the same time, you need basically double the amount of uh, uplink. So do a speed test, make sure you have enough mm -hmm. for what you want to do. Yeah, For streaming purposes, what we do in our office is we actually we have dedicated bandwidth to that studio space. So we have our IT department uh, basically dedicate a whole subnet just to us. I think it's like 30 meg or maybe 50 meg. That's uh, a lot. Just, just for those purposes. Now, this is again for streaming. If you're going to be streaming from your studio, for recording, it's less important. But still make sure that you have enough bandwidth if you have streams going out. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so now we get into kind of the tips and tricks section where we talk about some of the things that we've learned along the way that, that make things go really smoothly. Um, workflow stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you have a studio, if you have a dedicated studio, let's say somewhere in your office, you probably need some kind of a booking system, right? So to avoid that situation where you have two teams coming in saying, we're going to record now. No, we're going to record now. So you can use anything from Google Calendar to more advanced tools like Crestron panels. But just keep in mind, that's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, again, two uh, way. Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, we kind of talked a lot about this two-way yeah. communication and, and uh, make sure you have a good methods in, in place for that. Mm -hmm. We also mentioned on-air lights. So this is for outside the room now. So people don't walk in and don't create any extra noise as they're passing mm -hmm. by your studio. Yeah, we found that an on-air piece of paper stuck on your, tor t on your door with a piece of tape works pretty well too. Very so. high-tech, very high-tech. <laughs> Hot set. <laughs> um, take your time, take your time to rehearse the content. Uh, if you are doing a recording, there's a bit more leeway. You can record a few takes. takes. If you're live, you should probably know your content. So rehearsal generally takes more time than you think. So plan for that as well. Mm -hmm. And just getting people familiar with being in a studio environment and how to speak on camera. I mean, we've all gone through and, and looked at our first videos that we created as hosts here for different kind of webinars and live shows. And it is cringeworthy. I don't know about you, Marta. Oh, yeah. I do not like looking into the back catalog. It's hard. Um, it's <laughs> uh, because you get better at this, thank goodness. And so uh, a little bit of extra rehearsal time will go a long way. Mm hmm. Um, then you should think about technical help on standby. So if things go wrong, what do you do? What is your contingency plan? Just have that in the back of your head because things do go wrong. Uh, so you have to know what to do in case they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, this final one is having a dedicated producer to run your show. Now we are lucky to have Cameron who is behind the scenes right now doing all the magic, all the switching, the titling. And it really, really helps us uh, it makes us available just to deliver that content to you guys and to answer your questions. So this is probably something that you would graduate to, right? So you probably would need a, I need a producer now. Um, this is something that you can try doing yourself, but it's just much easier when you do have that dedicated person to do that. Yeah, and you're, you're going to do a much better presentation when you don't have to worry about the entire technical side, side of a production. Uh, you're more relaxed and anybody who's more relaxed is going to speak better on camera. They're going to look better and uh, they're going to look like they're having an okay time too. Cause if you're trying to produce a show and be the on-air talent, you're going to look stressed out in your eye. You're going to have big buggy eyes. So that's not a good look. So yeah, getting some help on that is a really great thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think that pretty much wraps it up for our presentation. We're going right. to take... we have... I cut you off. Go My ahead. Apologies. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, we have questions and, and Marta, we had talked about this. We wanted to let people know that, you know, we've covered all the content we're going to go over today, but there's a lot of great questions in there. So we're going to hang out here for another, well, however long it takes and try mm -hmm. to get through all these questions in Crowdcast. So please, if you have questions you want, add them to the questions that are already there and you can upvote the ones that are there as well. Exactly. So go into the ask a question section, uh, upvote the questions that you like. We're going to try to address those. And also please participate in our polls if you haven't done so already. So I'm just looking at the poll results right now. Let's see, so we had a question, how often do you create videos? We have about 44% of the people say that they create video often, 24% uh, sometimes, and then about 10% say never. So we do, we definitely have people who create videos today. Mm -hmm. um, um. There's a question up on screen right now that our producer has put up. Does mm -hmm. a parole system make sense for an on-premise uh, studio? And of course we are biased. Uh, we are the manufacturers of that equipment, but we also use it constantly for our studio environments. And we're all big fans of it for that reason. So I can say that it works uh, really, really well for mm -hmm. an on-premise studio. Try that. Actually, you can also book a demo. You can get a demo from one of our uh, support people and they'll walk you through all the features and you can really poke it and see if it's uh, going to work for them. Mm -hmm. We actually have that as a poll question, George. And I see that a lot of people are, are answering that, yes, this system uh, would work for them about 88%, which is great. Awesome. And 
it, again, That'd be embarrassing not, if it was like 2%. If it's like, no. <laughs> that would be pretty embarrassing. And uh, I'm just going to type into chat here. Uh, if you guys want to learn more about Pearl or if you have any questions, feel free to send us a note at uh, info at uh, And we will get back to you and we'll let you know exactly what you need to know. Okay. Um, Questions, so shall we look at the questions? Yes, yeah, so let's look at the yeah. questions. You can answer this first one. Are we going to be developing a replacement for the Webcaster X2? Well, thank you, George. Um, stay tuned. Epifan might have some really exciting announcements sometime soon. I'm just saying. Um, you know, it's true. We, we may. Um, I'll just jump in, Marta, because I don't want to be misleading at all. Um, we don't have anything immediately coming out, but we, uh, we're hoping to have something in the fall that we can talk about that might be interesting for those people. Yes, so st stay tuned. Won't be exactly the same, but it's a, it's, it's a very interesting product. Okay, um, so will this webinar be posted for later viewing? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you can always see all of our webinars on our epifan.com slash webinars page. That link has been thrown into chat as well. Um, and we have a few upcoming ones as well that you can sign up for, so check those out. Okay, done. Uh, will we be discussing transcription options, George? Well, that's a good point, actually. We didn't fit that into our presentation. It's kind of one of those additional services you may want to add on top of your studio. In fact, there's all kinds of things that we could talk about that might add value to your presentations, like transcription or translation. Um, and there's different ways to do transcription. We won't go into it too much today. We offer a hardware-based transcription uh, solution called LiveScript, which is for an in-room situation where you want to convert audio directly to text and add it to your broadcast. So take a look at LiveScript if you think mm -hmm. that might be a good fit for you. Uh, yeah, there's there also are... software-based ones as well that you can use. They're, I don't have as much experience with them, and they're a little bit, uh, little bit clunkier from what I can tell, but there's a few different ways to do it. Our moderators are going to throw a link into chat uh, to take you to LiveScript our hardware transcription device. And we also have a webinar on that. So if you check out our webinars page, you're going to find the LiveScript, LiveScript webinar there as well. Mm -hmm. um, this next question, Marta, what's the best way to send your sources to your switcher to direct remotely? Mm -hmm. So I'm I, not exactly sure how to interpret that, but you take So, it okay, so you're sending, you're sending your video sources to a switcher like a Perl. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the question is, can you produce your show remotely if you're not in the same room with your talent? And the answer is, I think, yes, you can. Uh, I think that's how Cameron is doing this right now. Uh, his video sources are essentially Zoom, right? So he's picking up um, the video source from his computer, which is Zoom. He's not like, located in the same room with us. And he's producing that remotely using Perl. So uh, personally, I think Perl is a good solution for remote producing, remote production. Sorry. I agree. Makes sense. <laughs> Done. We hope that we interpreted that question correctly. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can go into the, some of the technical side of it as well, because there's a voice few of God. That... Voice of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there'll be three votes for Perl 2 as your solution for remote video production. Uh, Marta, of course, we're using AV Studio today, or I'm using AV Studio, which if your Perl is connected to the internet, you can access your switching and all of your settings from anywhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. That's right. So AV Studio is the way we're doing that using Perl. Thank you, Cameron. Mm -hmm. Uh, this next one, Marta, what would you recommend for the minimum upload speed for streaming to Facebook or to YouTube? So both of those services have uh, minimum requirements. You can Google something like streaming on Facebook, a minimum bandwidth requirements, and they are going to tell you those, what they recommend. Uh, I think for the upload speed for streaming to YouTube or Facebook alone, I think they recommend somewhere around... 2,500 or so 2.5 meg. I think that's what they recommend. Yeah. If you ask George Herbert, who I'm sure is pulling his hair out a little bit right now, he will tell you if it's a full HD, a 1080p stream that uh, he tends to recommend eight. 
Mm-hmm. And the reason is because he, he he's thinking also about the inconsistency of your network. So while you might do a speed test and see that you have a solid, you know, 10 up, I should say solid, you have an instance where it's 10 up, uh, there's a good chance it's going to dip down periodically. So you mm-hmm. need to bake in a bit of headroom. So we say we'd like it to be five megabit per second all the time, but we recommend eight so that you have a bit of headroom there to, to withstand those. those uh, right. So spikes. look at the recommendations on those websites. Then also um, keep in mind, <laughs> George Herbert is <laughs> saying that he is ripping out his hair right now. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start that one over. Okay, so look at the recommendations on these websites. Keep in mind your streaming resolutions. If you're streaming at 4K versus 720, or Facebook can do 4K, uh, 720 versus 1080 is going to be a little bit different. And then it's always good to have headroom. So we always say um, take whatever um, bandwidth uh, bit rate you're streaming out and multiply that by two, and that is going to be your minimum uh, bandwidth that you need. Um, the reason I was looking around is because our next question is people are asking us what kind of microphones we're using with today. And I don't know what kind of microphone this is. This is a cheap, um, Amazon second plug of the day, uh, cheap Amazon mic that I got for about $70. And I got it because it was available because mics are kind of hard to find right now. So, uh, Mm -hmm. it's a USB mic as well. And I wanted a quick and dirty solution to be able to get audio in. Yeah. What, do you, so, what about you, Marta? I, I just have these uh, these wonderful Apple, not a plug, um, headphones in right now. And I'm using the microphone that I have right on here. I probably sound not as great as George, but microphones are kind of hard to get right now. Uh, it's probably, that's one of the reasons I, I'm using this right now. So we're kind of going against our own advice, but in this situation, they are really hard to get. Um. The next question, I like this question. Can you recommend a good quality yet cheap teleprompter program or hardware? That's from Jay. And I like this because I found this program this year that I loved. And I'm going to have to ask our moderators or Cameron to see if they remember the name of the app. And I will get it to you, Jay. But what's great about it is that some of these apps are, are um, they work in that they, they move the the script as they hear the words. So they have some AI intelligence so that when you say the words, then they advance, which means your talent can speak as slowly or as quickly as they like, and the app responds accordingly. So it's a wonderful uh, teleprompter app. And I'll I'll take note of your name here and I'll find a way to get a hold of you after the show here today. Um, If uh, our moderators don't jump in with the name of that app before the end of the show. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think uh, we but it, you said cheap. Our... I think it was like twenty dollars because it was kind of a fancier one. But uh, there's free ones too that I've used, and they're all pretty basic. Mm-hmm. I think that we've used that in our uh, Palo Alto studio, George. The one that you're uh, yes, that's about. right. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so someone's asking where are microphones hard to get. Um, well, I looked about a month ago when this whole world situation started, and uh, if you if you order a microphone now, you're going to get it in like two months, basically, or the price was so jacked up that I was like, I'm just, I'm just going to use this. And someone's saying that I sound okay. So this goes to show that you can get away uh, with using even something simple and, and sound good on camera. Yeah, that's right. We have people recommending the Rode uh, USB mics as well. Yeah. We like those as well. So Um, acoustic foam, how much acoustic foam do I need to get good results? Hmm. I think this uh, one is, you have to play by ear. You have a to, bunch. <laughs> a bunch. We got, oh my God, we got this whole pack for our, um, for our studio for just dirt cheap. It was like, it was like more than a hundred panels for like $9. It was crazy. Really? So yeah, they, they were, they weren't expensive for whatever reason. And they came in super packed and we had to open them and let them expand. <sighs> I always like stuff that's compressed that's, back like that. That's a good yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but basically, you need to cover up the reflective surfaces in your room. So if you have a, a room with a lot of reflective surfaces, if your floor is a problem, you're going to have to think about the carpeting. Your ceiling is not a... You can hang blankets from a ceiling. Sometimes that helps. But if you have a lot of bare walls and windows, like you kind of need to cover up as much until you, you do the clap test and you find it's not quite so bad. Mm-hmm. But it can be cheap. Like you said, it doesn't have to be specialized audio equipment. It's really just some kind of soft surface will 
get you 80% of the way there. It's not going to look great necessarily if you hang up like bathrobes all over your, your room, but. <laughs> right, but you can hide work. those. So just for, for your background, you're going to use something nice like a green screen. And then for everything else, you can go with curtains, right? They're a lot less yes. expensive than That's those true. acoustic mm -hmm. blankets. Even uh, moving blankets. I know that we use those for our second studio to kind of dampen the sound a little bit. And I think Matthew yesterday was even recommending um, mattresses. You have nothing else. Mattresses <laughs> against the walls. Well, I'm hearing all these podcasts and people are saying, here, I'm live from my bedroom my closet. closet. Yes. <laughs> because they're all huddled in there trying to find decent audio within their house. And a closet's a pretty good bet with all your, your, your clothing in mm -hmm. there. And I also heard that having bookshelves also helps because, um, because those books also help to dampen the sound. Basically, anything, the less flat reflective areas you have, the more kind of ribs you have, uh, the more sound is going to be absorbed. Yeah. Um, so just a reminder for if anybody in our team here knows what that teleprompter app is, uh, we have a lot of people asking for it in chat and I will make a note of it. And I will add it to the chat before the, well, either just shortly after this, this broadcast, if I can find it. Mm -hmm. um, um, we have a question here. Can, Canon model, please. Uh, so George, could you go over what, are, which camera are you using right now? I, this is the, I always get the lens mount and the camera mixed up. This is the rp this is the rp the canon rp but i was also talking about the canon r <laughs> all these acronyms the c200 the canon c200 the vixia camcorders honestly quite a few and i'm not exactly sure which model here uh mm. or when this comment came in so it's kind of hard to make yeah it. maybe puja can can clarify for sure, us sure yeah uh, does the Pro Mini have the features for layouts? Yes, it does. You can make all your custom layouts just like you're looking at in this webinar today. That's right. And let's see, what about the oh, color? Oh, this is a great the, question. Is that yeah. the one, the color of the walls? Yeah. And in the studio, does this influence the illumination we are using? George, totally. what do you think? I absolutely agree. Um, like if you have white walls, your subject is going to be well illuminated. Uh, we painted our studio in Ottawa to be a dark gray. And that's because it allowed us to control all the light and not worry about light reflecting off of other surfaces. So uh, having a dark studio kind of gives you more control, but having a studio with white walls gives you like free light. So, uh, I, or having windows like we've got here today. So it depends mm -hmm. kind of what you're building. And yeah. having a green screen as well is gonna make you crazy as well. Cause I'm pointing backwards as though I have one, I don't. But the, the light usually bounces off the green screen and you get a little bit of a green fringe on people's heads or on their shoulders and stuff like that. So yeah, the colors of the walls and the surfaces are gonna influence your lighting tremendously. Mm -hmm. I remember having to stream from like a blue room. The, all the walls were like a teal color and it really affected the way my face looked. So I always looked a little bit sick. <laughs> yeah, so you would, that, yeah. That's definitely something to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah, you want something nice and orangey and right in front of you to reflect. And you can actually do that, get little bounce cards and stuff like that that will just help cast a bit of light. Mm -hmm. This next one, what is the key selling point when uh, marketing my studio to external users? Why would someone hire my space for services? That's a good question. And Marty, you and I are not really the best people to answer that because we don't do studios for hire. I mean, we have done this a little bit and we're trying to learn about it. Mm -hmm. um, what we did you can, find when you had customers coming into your Palo Alto studio? Because we did rent that out for a little while. Right, right, right. So uh, we had a lot of CEOs coming in to record their message. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it was just, it was a short message, maybe like a two to five minute segment. And it took us one or two hours to film that, right? So uh, it may seem that if your video is short, the video that you're trying to make is really short, it's only going to take five minutes, never the case. So you need that nice studio setup for people to be able to come in and everything is ready to go. You don't have to set everything up. They come in and they focus on the content. And even with everything set up, it still takes a lot of time to get to that content. So it's really nice to have a space that you can go into and everything is just ready to go for you. And, and you, can, you can kind of sh showcase your results, showcase the videos that you're making to your clients and be like, hey, you can make this video in my studio. Yeah, I agree. Having something where they can get in and out quickly, I gotta think that's a huge selling point. Um, and it has to look great as well. 
Like it's kind right. of like really slick. Right, right, right. Yeah, we had we had all kinds of people come in um, to record, um, like a video business card. Right. We had people with foundations come in to record their message. CEOs. Mm -hmm. It was mostly recording. We mostly used that studio for recording, and maybe only a few times for streaming. Uh, we did the live show from from that studio quite often as well. Right. Uh, this next question. Uh, would you have schematics plans for all the AV equipment? I don't think we have schematics. Um, yeah, the best I, I can offer you, Mark, would be we have blogs where we have covered everything we're talking about today, how to build a studio and everything you might want. So that blog might be of assistance for you. Maybe one of our moderators can put it into the chat for you. Mm -hmm. um, but we it's not have, really a schematic. <clears throat> I can think of at least two blogs that we have. One is about setting up your studio for streaming. Oh, three blogs. Uh, building a corporate studio, uh, tips for building a streaming studio, and then tips for building a recording studio. So yeah, if our moderators could drop those into chat, that would be wonderful. Um, this next, are there plans for the Pearl to support SRT for custom streams? Uh, I hope so, because I know SRT is a pretty capable tool uh, for low latency streaming. So uh, we'll have to wait and see on that. Mm -hmm. um, how big a budget do you need to get all the equipment required for entry level videos? That's a really good question. Uh, the, again, I would point to one of your blogs, Marta. Marta manages our blog and writes. I would say the a lot corporate. Of the there. Yeah, how to build your corporate studio. Uh, it has it has a sample um, equipment list. So mm -hmm. if you just go through all of those on B and H and try to estimate. We didn't put the prices in because they always change. But if you want an estimate, you can you can look at that gear list and kind of try to figure out how much that might cost. Yeah, there's so many variables. Like, if, for example, if you want to use your own computer as the encoder for it, um, if you already have a camera or an audio source, that's going to that's going to get you a lot of the way there. So it's hard for us to give just a ballpark figure. And really, you can spend as much as you want. Like some of the studios we looked at today were in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, most of the studios that we tend to talk about, I would say, are certainly in the two to five thousand dollar range. Or you no, know, even more than that. What am I? What am I kidding? More like five to ten thousand dollars is kind of what mm -hmm. we think is this maybe the sweet spot. Yeah. I'm just going to throw those links into chat. So I did the corporate production studio. Okay. Oh, someone uh, found a... the teleprompter. Oh, no. Yes. There's just two links, actually. There's someone's talking about the video teleprompter pro. And then uh, one of our moderators put in the, yes, prompt smart pro. Very cool. But there's probably lots of apps like this now because it's pretty uh, commoditized kind of AI. Mm -hmm. So a longer yes. question here. I'm going to turn my walk-in closet into a studio so that I can do a one-person broadcast with my DJ equipment. How can I broadcast live from Facebook, Instagram, YouTube at the same time? So if your question is really about how to do multi-streaming, uh, Lynette, which I think that's what you're looking for here, um, there's a few ways to do multi-streaming. You can get a hardware appliance like uh, Pearl 2 or Pearl Mini, and those are capable of sending out multiple streams at the same time. Um, but you may also want to choose if you're not using an appliance like that and you're using software to do your streaming, there are restreaming services, which are kind of convenient. You stream to one website like restream.io and they will then restream it to as many platforms as you like. So if you just look up restreaming software, uh, that will get you a good part of the way there, I think, or buy a Pearl 2 and you're laughing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right, this next one. Oh, okay, so we answered the minimum budget, right? What's the minimum budget? Oh, I for think it's the second home, person with the same. For a home video studio. I think it's the same answer. Just check out yeah. those blogs that we threw into chat uh, to try to get an estimate. The reason we don't really list prices, again, is because they fluctuate and it's really hard to estimate. So yeah, I'm just going to mark uh, that. But if I can say, if you're only recording and you're not trying to do live streaming, that simplifies things quite a bit because you can record all of your footage on camera and just do a bunch of editing afterwards. So you could get away with a camera and a microphone if it's a recording studio mm -hmm. only, right? Mm -hmm. So we have um, just one last question left. Wow. Uh, I, I want to use people from a few different locations at the same time, all live. 
Switching between locations and picture in picture possibly too. What would be the best way to do that? Well, that is exactly how we're making this show right now. Uh, we are all dialed into one Zoom room. It's just a Zoom meeting. It's not Zoom webinars. And then our producer is cropping out our talking heads alongside with the presentation that George is sharing. All of that is going into Perl. And then our producer is using um, Ep Epifan Live, which is our production switcher, to switch between the various layouts that he created beforehand. So we are biased, but we think that this is a good solution for this. Mm -hmm. And it, it's truly remote. Our, our production facilities are unmanned in Ottawa. I'm outside of Ottawa in my home, and Marta is in California, and we're all doing this together. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to be coming up with some new ways to talk about how to do remote uh, guest work uh, later on in June. So make sure you stay tuned in because we have some news coming out about how to optimize this even further. Yes. Uh, if you want to see how we're doing this today, we did a webinar on this and we did a live show on this. So if you go to our YouTube channel or go to our website, there's going to be a few great examples of how to do kind of a remote guest uh, workflow. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely check out our webinars. Uh, we do go over that in great detail. Yes. So I think that's it. We've got all the questions. We, we do. We do have two more questions. DJ Straight. <laughs> uh, we did get two more questions, George, while we're answering that. Okay, we're just going to address these two. And then we're going we're gonna to wrap it up because we are running out of time. So the first question is, what about low latency stream, like less than two seconds, for streaming that is possible with any platform? So I, what would you say to that, George? I'd say you're going to see that over the next year, you're going to see a lot of improvements there with other technologies like HLS and SRT and Dash. These are all streaming protocols and they allow for a much, much lower latency uh, live streaming experience. So mm -hmm. um, it's not commonplace now. It will be over the next year. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that next year, when we look at this question, we can look back and talk about how, remember the good old days when it was like 20 seconds for a live stream to, to make it yeah. work. Yeah. Uh, so stay tuned. And there's also right now, I think there's Zoom, Zoom webinars for that. Uh, it's not, you can, you can then restream to any platform. Uh, there's still going to be latency on the platform, but within the Zoom webinar with your live attendees, there's going to be very low latency. Yeah. There's really a lot of different way, ways to talk, talk about latency, the latency mm -hmm. between Marta and I communicating, the latency between us and our Perl system, and then from the Perl system to the internet. And so there's a lot of different uh, parts of that latency uh, chain, if you will. Mm -hmm. And this last one is not a question. People are just thanking us, George. So I think, uh, thank you very much for watching. I think we can wrap this up. Uh, yeah, that's all the questions. Yes. And thank you so much for watching us. Uh, and thank you for submitting questions and uh, replying to our polls. Please check out epifan.com slash webinars. For more webinars, sign up for our new webinars. And if you have any more questions or you want to talk more about our Perl systems, uh, please send us a note to info at apifan.com and we'll try to get those to those as fast as we can. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, Kat. Marta. Nice to see you. All right. Thank you, George. Bye, everybody. See you.